Oh, man. <coughs> Hi, folks. It's me again, Dave. Whew. Well, you know, today is a good day to talk about respiratory protection. Some of you might think that these flimsy little dust masks are respirators. They're not. A lot of scrapyard workers wear them to keep all the dirt and dust from clogging up their nose. But that doesn't make it a respirator. Remember that if you're required to wear one of these, OSHA considers it to be a respirator, just like the chemical cartridge respirators you might see burners wearing. Respirators should be a last resort because OSHA wants us to engineer these airborne hazards out of our workplace. I know, that can be tough in a scrapyard environment, but the law is the law. If there's no other way to protect you and you have to wear one, you can't just grab one out of the box and put it on. There's stuff to do first. Basically, OSHA requires that all workplaces do a hazard assessment to determine if there are any inhalation hazards that we need to worry about. I'm not talking about the gas attacks my buddy Big Willie constantly unleashes during lunch. Whoo! Man, he should get a license for those things. But there is a permissible exposure limit, or PEL for nuisance dusts, as well as other airborne dusts, fumes, vapors, mists, and gases. Someone from your company, probably the safety manager, should have done a careful review of all the inhalation hazards that might exist in your yard. Those reviews determine where you need to use respirators. If they find areas or jobs that may require a respirator and the problem can't be engineered away, there's a few things that have to happen. First is the creation of a written respirator program that details all of the hazards and methods to control them through the use of respirators or modified work habits, or both. The written respirator program discusses how to select the right respirator for the job and instructs people on how to use them correctly. Watching this video is a phenomenal start. But let's not forget one of the most important yet often overlooked parts of a good respiratory protection program, determining the concentration of exposure. You can't just stick a respirator on your face without knowing what you're trying to protect yourself from. A simple dust mask ain't gonna protect you from some nasty chemical vapors or noxious gases. A sampling pump tests the air in a worker's breathing zone to figure out what the airborne concentration is. A lot of scrapyards use consultants to do this kind of industrial hygiene survey. Sometimes your worker's compensation insurance carrier will do it. Bottom line, before you do anything, you gotta know what and how much you're dealing with. And once we know the exposure level, we can select a respirator that fits the job. But make sure to consider whether you can actually use it without it causing harm to your health. See, there's a requirement for a potential respirator user to be medically evaluated by a healthcare professional before he or she starts using a respirator. This applies to anyone using a respirator because the exposure is above the permissible exposure limit. There's a special form and questionnaire to be filled out by this medical officer in order to qualify you to use it. Cigarette smokers or someone with a pre-existing condition like asthma or emphysema might not be able to use a respirator. So the medical professional completes the evaluation and makes that decision. Okay. Now that we know the basics of respiratory protection programs, oh, wait a second. Is that the ice cream man? I gotta go. I'll tell you next time how to properly use a respirator. <laughs> hey, and remember, you, you need to operate safely or not at all. Wait a minute. Hey, I got 50 cents. I want a, a vanilla ice cream sandwich and a ho-ho. Hey, ice cream man, wait a minute. I got a quarter. What can I get for a quarter? <laughs>